Thank you. Just to, please, please humor me with a quick uh, experiment. If a surgeon comes to you and says, we have to remove a digit, it doesn't matter why, just that you have to remove one, which one do you pick? Can you please, can you do it? Can you just please hold it up? You see one, and photo opportunity. Perfect. Okay, so I see lots of pinkies and no thumbs. Everyone wants to be pinky -less. There's something. There's something important here. You can think of the, the thumb and the index fingers being somehow more important to avoid damaging, but the, the pinkies will be a sacrifice if and only if you need to. So this, in fact, is not my research, <laughs> but it is related. So it turns out that accounting for regional dose volume effects in some organs will improve or may improve radiotherapy outcomes. That's an that's a important finding. So in this case, we've got a left broaded. So just a, a reminder, what happens when we deliver dose to a product or too much dose? Well, products produce saliva, and lack of saliva is hypofunction, that leads to xerostomia, leads to dental caries, uh, quality of life issues, pain, and uh, just un general unpleasantness. It's also quite common. So our goal is very simple. We want to simply search for this regional dose, uh, or organ dose volume dependence, and, and help outcomes. Uh, a couple, couple problems. So first of all, acquiring outcomes data. Turns out that this is quite simple. We simply collect saliva in a cup over five minutes and measure it. We do this three times. Before treatment, uh, three months after treatment, and one year after treatment. So the next two points are actually related. Dealing with the consistent contour names and handling 3D organ geometry are important if you're going through 100 patients. Um, I wrote a piece of software called Dicomatomaton that I'm not going to spend much time talking about, but it can slice and dice these organ contours, um, chop them up, and then chop those up. It's composable. Uh, it works wonders. Uh, you can also do dosimetric calculations, all sorts of other good stuff. So you, know, you can also deal with the contour naming scheme. Again, I can't really talk about it, but um, for the purposes of this study, we're going to split the product along a coronal plane and then split that along a sagittal plane, giving us quadrants. Salivary glands in quadrants. Problems out of the way. So let's get on to the findings. So here we've got a histogram of patient measurements at baseline. Free radiotherapy. Um, vertical axis, we've got a bin count, patient number. The horizontal axis, we have measured salivary function. So the amount of spit in the cup. Three months after radiotherapy, just slams to the left. Patients are unfortunately salivary lists or considerably more so. And in fact, that lower bar was way up to the ceiling. Um, one year, not a lot of improvement, but a little bit. If you put that one year back to the baseline, you see there's a significant reduction. So important point, uh, salivary open loss and recovery were both significant. And yes, xerostomia is a significant issue in this cohort. So let's get on to some more important findings, outcomes and dose. Um, so all my plots look like this, most of them, so I'll we'll describe a little bit of detail. So most importantly, this is for, not for quadrants yet, this is for the whole product. That straight line looks like a linear line. It's not. It's a non-parametric, local, linear, regressed line. So it could be curvy. Uh, it just happened to work out that way. On the left axis, we've got spit in the cup. This is salivary loss. And on the x-axis, we've got dose to the product. Blue is cold, red is hot. Nice, nice correlation there. Very linear. Uh, in case you're wondering, those, those units are gray, and who got 90 gray? Well, actually, this is combined dose, so it's literally just dose on the left plus dose to the right. Let's go into the quadrants now. Um, you can see for the anterior lateral quadrant, a um, little wavier, but in terms of the error bars there, very similar. All the other quadrants also turn out to be very similar. Um, a little too similar. It's not what we were expecting. So let's split that combined dose into two axes, on a surface, and then, uh, or sorry, fit a surface. So we've got the familiar saliva in the cup, dose to the left, dose to the right. Um, if we do a bootstrap technique using the whole product in each individual quadrant separately, we kind of get a, a primary confidence interval. It turns out to be fairly Gaussian, which is nice. Um, and then we want to compare that. So this is really the most important plot in the, in the talk. Um, what we see is that the whole product in blue is acting significantly different from the anterior, posterior, uh, medial, and lateral portions.
This looks like the blue and the purple look very non-overlapping, which is great. Um, this is for at least some of squares fitting. And in, indeed, if we, if we look at those gaussians and compare them, they're statistically significantly different. Perfect. The issue shows up when we use a little bit more robust te uh, technique known as least median squares. And it turns out that the least median squares strongly, very strongly disagrees with the least sum of squares. And so um, we can't, in good faith, say that we found any kind of dose, dose volume embedded. So to summarize that, celebrate output loss was correlated with dose. But it turns out that using the loss prediction using quarters appears to be no better than using whole product. Shucks. So under recovery, um, another like hopefully we can't can't use loss, but maybe the patient can recover with this with the magic dose. They'll be perfect. Um, for whole product, you can see there is a little bit of an arch. So with some dose, patients do recover a little bit, but really it's not very much. Twenty percent. In fact, if we fit a straight line through this, it fits just as well as any sort of a model, a exponential model, a model or an arch that I try to fit. If we again look at the quadrants. Very similar, unfortunately. If we look at the surfaces plotted for recovery, we again can see they're, they're very similar, they're not distinct. There's no portion that looks any different than the other. We keep zooming in on the product, it seems to be just continue behaving just like the whole product. In fact, if we zoom right in, the, the noise and the measurements were awful, so it's almost not surprising that we couldn't find anything. So findings, salivary open recovery was weakly associated with dose, um, same issues as loss, so lots of noise. So you may notice that there's, uh, it's, it's kind of tricky, we, we kind of saw some differences, but we can't, we can't in good faith claim that there are differences. Um, but the absence of regional sensitivity was observed, we didn't prove that it wasn't there, so we can keep going with this. How can we do that? Well, fundamentally, we want to split the blue and the orange Gaussian apart. We do that most easily by um, narrowing the Gaussians. We can do that with more data, with more sophisticated math, using quality of life, but <laughs> in particular, um, using more, more precise measurement techniques like anatomical or functional information. So just to give a demo, uh, patient pre and post RT, you can see a significant difference in the volume of the product, you would, you would certainly expect this to have an effect on uh, salivary output. And in fact, we're not taking, into this, uh, taking this into account yet. So we really should. Just to summarize, salivary loss is correlated with dose. Super linear, very nice. Um, salivary recovery was not correlated. I should say not associated with dose, but correlated is easier to think about. Um, whole product may be no worse than quadrants for breaking xerostomia. But really, the point that I want, I want you to take away is that with the hand analogy, there doesn't appear to be a thumb in the product. <laughs>
So the, the accumulated dose or the total dose you're using, I don't understand why you're doing that. Why is it dose and plus dose? Because there is no part of the parotid that's hitting 90 grade. That's right. If you look at individual voxels within the parotid, they're getting up to 45 grade. That's right. So I don't understand the 90 grade. Why don't you just leave it at 45 grade? Uh, it turns out that just if we, we do the combined dose thing or we sum them up, we get a very nice linear response in outcomes versus dose. Um, I don't know why. That's, that's, that's the rationale, though. Thank you, Helene.